So we've been talking about the evidence for evolution and we explained how that can actually provide evidence for the sequence of development of the history of life on Earth. And we're going to be talking about that through a different kind of lecture in this year. But understand that evolution will explain how animals evolved, the order in which they evolved, why they evolved the way they evolved, all the structures that they have, what those structures do, why they're the best structures to do what they do, and why we have similarities to other animals, why we have differences from other animals, why some animals which do not share common ancestors sometimes have the same structures, why we have structures which we don't use but are remnant from our ancestors. It explains the, the things that happen in life with uh, biogeography or distribution of life. It explains DNA similarities and, and what the DNA record is telling you. It explains the fossil record. It explains everything parsimoniously. The simplest possible explanation for the history and function of life. So evolution is definitely the way that life works. Now there's two basic types of evolution in terms of pacing. And we're going to learn more about these concepts in the next lecture series. But for now, just know the basics. Evolution can happen quickly, suddenly, under certain conditions. And we call that punctuated equilibrium. We just see that on the right side. Sudden changes uh, because of um, environmental pressures or bottleneck effect or foundry effect or things like that and we'll talk about that in the next video lecture series or it can happen gradually over time in a more complex process of speciation that involves successive small changes in population as uh, genetics and or one little microevolution at a time towards macroevolution and that's called gradualism model and today we actually think that the true evolution is a combination of both things put together Likewise, there's two kinds of evolution in terms of what it creates. You're going to have convergent evolution, divergent evolu or evolution. Now, convergent evolution is when two animals uh, end up with the same structure even though they do not have the same uh, ancestor. And the perfect example of that is going to be the, the, the birds, the mammals, and the uh, dinosaurs and the bugs all with wings because they were under similar pressures where wings were actually um, useful. So you have the different kinds of analogous structures. So analogous structures is evidence of convergent evolution where animals converge towards a look because of similar pressures on the environment. Likewise, divergent evolution is when uh, two species so come up from the original species, which is also called adaptive radiation. And examples of that is that all different kinds of mammals came from the same ancestral mammal, as seen by homologous structures. So just like analogous structures are evidence of conversion evolution, homologous structures are evidence of common ancestry or divergent evolution or adaptive radiation. There's also parallel evolution, which is when two species are different from each other and evolve separately from each other into separate looks that have nothing to do with each other. And that's basically um, parallel evolution in that case. Here you see more examples of that homology that I was just describing, which is evidence of divergent evolution. And remember that this homology can be at the molecular level too, when you look at proteins from different kinds of animals that have different functions and almost identical structures. Uh, evidence of convergent evolution can also be seen in different ecosystems where animals evolve to fulfill similar roles. For example, there always seems to be a, bo a burrower in environments. Always seems to be something that fulfills the purpose of that mice fulfill. Uh, or climbers on the environment, or gliders in the environment, or, ca or cats or feline predators in the environments, or canine uh, uh, things in the environments. And those are evidence of both divergent and convergent evolution. It's divergent because all these different kinds of animals came from the same original uh, species where back when Pangaea was still together. But as Pangaea split apart, these split into different continents which have different environments. So you have different uh, kinds of that kind of animal in different environments because of different pressures. But sometimes they end up with the same structures, not because they have the same ancestor, but because they have similar pressures on those similar environments. So, in comes the idea of an evolutionary niche that throughout the history of life 
you have these roles that animals fulfill in the environments. What the animals do, where they live, what they eat, where they are in the food chain, and that there always seems to be animals fulfilling these roles. And if an animal goes extinct, that opens the opportunity for a new kind of animal to assume this role because now it's not going to be able to, there's not going to be competing with anything else. So normally when mass extinctions take place, it clears out the niches, which allows for new diversity, new kinds of life to show up and fill up these roles where no competition exists and they can basically take over these roles, which foster the development of new kinds of life forms where the pressure is basically leading them to a, to a function or a look that there's less competition about. And that's also what creates things like analogous structures. For example, the fish, uh, the mammals, and the reptiles which swum in the oceans of the world throughout history have all evolved separate times and, for, and separate ways because they were each fulfilling an available niche at the time. At the time that the ichthyosaurs actually evolved, they evolved because there were no pre top predators to actually fulfill the niche. So it had the chance to evolve. Just like the dolphin has evolved to fulfill a similar niche today. Or the shark evolved a long time ago to fulfill the same niche before. And so whenever you have available niches, this is going to happen. And that explains the geographic and temporal diversity of life. And remember... Uh, mass extinctions will open up these niches or even just an extension of even one of these animals will open up the niches. For example, if the dolphin went extinct, that will open up a room for a new animal to assume the role that the a dolphin is, has on the environment. Another important concept that has to do with evolution or types of evolution is micro versus macro evolution. Now, micro evolution, it has to do with changes in terms of the genetic composition of a population. So that's a population uh, changing because the genes change through mutations or because selection made more of one kind be common than another or because new kinds of animals came over and migration added new animals to the environment or because animals dispersed throughout the environment or because the population developed into a different kind of, 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 of look. But... This is not a change in terms of a new species coming about. It's a change in the, in the confirmation of the species. Let me give you an example with the human race so it makes sense for you. If a virus came over that killed every single person that had green eyes, the human race would not go extinct. But a major shift in the gene, gene pool of the population would occur where all of a sudden all the green genes will be almost completely deleted except for the people who carry it as a recessive trait, all right, uh, on their actual uh, heterozygous look. But either way, that would actually cause a shift in the gene pool of the human race. And that's an example of microevolution. It's still humans. It's just that we won't have green eye humans anymore. You follow what I'm saying? Uh, but macroevolution is when either to punctuate equilibrium, which is sudden changes, or through successive gradual changes like the one I just described, you change the human population towards a, a new kind of human, you know? And that's when you're going to have separation between the animals, leading to independent evolution of two branches of the tree of life, or historical constraints, or environmental pressure that only existed at a, a certain period of time, or selection for a certain species rather than another. So that is macroevolution. In other words, changes to form new kinds of species. For example, the difference between a uh, Neanderthal and a human, or a, a Chromos magnus and a Homo sapiens, or a uh, change between uh, a mammoth and a modern elephant. That is a change in the actual species, or a completely different kind of animal which could not possibly have babies with the kind of animal that comes to be for. And where we're going from here now is that we're going to have a lecture series about each kind of evolution. The next one is going to be about macroevolution, and then the one after that about macroevolution. So you can see the mechanisms that make each one of these things possible and understand how evolution can possibly actually work, either genetically or changing at the species level. I hope you learned a lot in this lecture series. I will do one more video, which may not necessarily be in your quiz, but it's going to be about the myths about evolution so that you're not caught by the, by the bad things people say about evolution and sound ignorant about it. 
All right? I'll see you guys then.